district ruling is a topic that's very close to our heart at DEFCO. So we are very happy that uh, the South Asian Institute is picking that up. We have some very brilliant speakers with us today. First of all, we're going to hear from uh, the IEA, um, from uh, Chair de Mastro. They will talk on uh, their work on cooling in general, how the demand for cooling globally is growing. Uh, and also uh, how they see district cooling fitting into that picture. Um, after that, I will give a little introduction to district cooling in Europe, what's happening on the markets, what are the drivers and so on. And then we'll turn to some very specific uh, examples of implementation of district cooling. That's, of course, very important and, and show us some good practice and best cases for how it's done. And first of all, we'll go to Vienna and hear from Alexander Valish uh, on how they have developed district cooling in Vienna along with the, the large district heating system that's in operation down there. That's going to be extremely interesting. And then uh, lastly, we'll hear from Alex Avancic that has been a, a major part of the development of district cooling in Barcelona. Um, so very much looking forward to this session uh, and then Without further ado, again, I'll, I'll leave the word to uh, Chair Adel Mastro from IEA uh, to talk us to us. The floor is yours, Chair. Thank you very much for this uh, introduction. Let me just share my screen. Okay. And thanks to the organizers for having me here. Just checking if you are seeing my screen correctly now. Yes. Okay, great. Uh, um, as Jacob uh, said, I'm working at VIA, um, focusing on sustainable buildings at the Energy Technology Policy Division, and I'm also covering the role of Desk Officer for the District Heating and Cooling Technology Collaboration Progress Program. And today, we will see some of the key trends for space cooling, and uh, at the end of the presentation, some of the opportunities we see for district cooling. Uh, the IA is working extensively on buildings and space cooling with projects that looks uh, at the sector indirectly as a part of the broader energy systems, but also looking at the building sector specifically at some of its end uses. For space cooling, we started uh, three years ago with the Future of Cooling publication, a global analysis followed by some more regional roadmaps as the future of cooling in China and the future of cooling in Southeast Asia. We also provide snapshots of the current situation with short-term recommendation, as in the tracking clean energy progress, as we see uh, in the slide, where we can see that we need more efforts for cooling to be aligned with longer-term climate objectives. And in this presentation, we're going to see why. Um, we all have heard that uh, the demand for cooling services is rising uh, rapidly and that there is still a great disparity among the ownership of air conditioners and uh, the people that need cooling, uh, in particular uh, among the people that live in very hot and humid places. At the same time, we expect that uh, this situation will change quickly uh, due both to rising living standards, but also twin waves. And we expect already to 2030 uh, to have residential air conditioners to increase by around two thirds compared to today. We have been looking up to 2070, where we expect that uh, three fourths of uh, uh, world households could have at least one air conditioners. And if in this picture we uh, include residential units. This means almost quadrupling the number of units that we have today. In the same time horizon, the building floor area is expected to increase by more than two folds. So these two factors combined together make uh, space cooling one of the most critical blind spots of our global energy system. Um, despite some of the positive policy signs that we have seen in recent years, uh, space cooling it is already the fastest growing energy using buildings. And by taking into account current trends, as we do in our stated policy scenario, we see that energy consumption for space cooling will increase as much as 50% by 2030 and almost triple by 2070. Implication of this are not just on uh, uh, the building sector, but on the energy system as a whole, whole because the space cooling will drive at least one fifth of the global growth of electricity consumption by 2070. 
Um, and this will put enormous stress on the power system and of, uh, especially for meeting peak demands. At the same time, we're also seeing many opportunities with the technologies and the systems we have now to limit uh, the impact of the growth of the stock of air conditioners. Uh, in our sustainable development scenarios, uh, which has a trajectory of emissions uh, to reach net zero emissions globally by 2070, we see that space cooling demand can be cut in half, almost in half, by addressing three key priorities on the technology side. The first one is to have uh, uh, better buildings and improved urban planning, so reducing the need for the demand of cooling. The second is to increase the performances of the technologies and the systems, distribution systems progressively. In particular, we need performances of sold equipment to move from four today to seven at least in 2030, and also to uh, the ability to fulfill different uh, loads and variability. So the third point is to integrate more flexible and responsive solutions, which are able to increase the whole uh, energy system efficiency. We had a look in terms of emission, what this means, and this means uh, saving cumulatively 27 gigatons of CO2 emissions by space cooling technologies alone from 2020 to 2070 in the uh, sustainable development scenarios compared to the stated policy scenarios. And this is equivalent to 27 times what is currently emitted by the space cooling sector today globally. As we said before, uh, we already have in the market very efficient space cooling technologies and systems. Um, but what we see from the figures is that 80% of what is needed is achieved by mature and early adoption technologies. And especially over a longer term, we need uh, to accelerate the deployment of the technologies which are not yet in mass market today, which also includes um, district cooling and also thinking of efficient solutions which are able to phase out global warming potential refrigerants, integrating renewable and storage within the cooling systems, improved dehumidifications and also improved control systems. Another point that we can uh, get from these figures is that, especially on a more longer term, we also need further innovation. Um, for example, looking at demonstration technologies that we have now, for example, including more hybrid solution, the capability to exploit synergies with other end uses, and also more innovation in designs, for example, thinking in compress at compressors. Uh, we have mapped uh, all uh, the mentioned technologies and much more into the ETP, Clean, en Clean Energy Technology Guide. It is an interactive framework which contains information for over 400 technologies or components within uh, the whole energy system. In the slides, we see a picture of the uh, of, uh, magnitude of the technologies we modeled. And uh, uh, all of these technologies as a role to achieve all net zero emissions to 2070. For each of these technologies, we uh, include information on the level of maturity, uh, compilation of uh, development and deployment plans, key players in the field, but also performance improvement targets and <coughs> key uh, activities in the technology area. Among those, of course, uh, we have district heating, district heating that district cooling that uh, today is uh, still a development segment uh, in particular it is estimated that uh, nowadays it supply less than five percent of the global cooling demand uh, but also with significant progress in uh, recent years and we see uh, these technologies as very promising for several reasons we're going to see some of the most important for us uh, first is that uh, uh, where it is suitable to be deployed so in very dense areas with dense space cooling needs, um, we see that fits very uh, well the view of a more integrated and responsive energy system, in particular for the ability uh, to integrate several sources of energies like free and natural sources and also others that otherwise would have been wasted. We see as a uh, source of flexible capacity 
capacity to um, fulfill different loads efficiently and uh, reliably. And also we uh, see it as a provider for peak sharing opportunities. So through the network in itself, but also through storage that can um, absorb, absorb excess electricity, but also eat from other sectors. Uh, in particular, we see uh, district cooling as a system that can host uh, innovative concepts, uh, which can create uh, cross-sectoral uh, synergies, especially uh, with non-space cooling uses. For example, um, uh, thinking of heat recovery to produce hot water and also our solution, which are able to increase the overall system efficiency. To this last point, um, in particular, we see that due to the growing cooling capacity, we can have a sort of uh, even a reverse trend where the cooling market, the eating market can learn from the cooling market in the future, uh, especially if we look at uh, vapor compression technologies, we have seen that innovation in the cooling market can have a potential spillovers into the eating market. Uh, let's think, for example, to these new compressors for, um, or also heat recovery. And this uh, will deliver economic benefits on, uh, on both the eating and cooling markets. And we think that this is very important. Um, as uh, another point, additional point, is that the advantages for district cooling can be uh, more pronounced in the area with, uh, where it island are a significant problem and where on-site air conditioner is one of the cause um, for the heat island itself. And also in addition can uh, solve some urban planning problem as a space constraints in urban areas or aesthetic. Uh, to con to just to point out to the audience that might be interested to this, the district heating and cooling technology collaboration progress program delivered the uh, guideline for sustainable district cooling. So it can be of interest. Uh, to conclude, some of the um, key action to scale up the opportunities for uh, district cooling that we see uh, is certainly one related to the awareness, to the awareness of the benefits, but to the also awareness of how it operates. So providing more evidence of uh, to the different stakeholders which are involved of the systems which are successful, for example, as is done in these calls. Also including the benefits to, to society. Um, another point, an awareness is the awareness about the potential, especially because this uh, solution is very locally dependent. Uh, we think more work needs to be done to understand the local condition and to support the research, to map resources uh, and needs that we have. Uh, we think that we need uh, additional, additional R&D to test uh, these innovative concepts as hybrid system, coupling, uh, for example, vapor compression and absorption chillers, design of new compressors of improved dehumidification. Um, and on the policy side, we need that we think, uh, we need some um, policy at both the national and local level to enable the conditions to deploy the district cooling technologies, for example, to be included into national policies as an energy efficiency measures and also on a more local level to have a legal framework that design market conditions for district cooling. Uh, on this point also since it is associated to very local conditions and also building characteristics, we think uh, there is more work needed to include it in uh, urban planning to align timing and objectives, for example, through appropriate zonings uh, within the urban municipality plans itself. And at last, uh, we think that we need some new business models to uh, attract finance to the sectors. Thank you very much and uh, looking forward to um, questions and the discussion later on. Thank you very much for your presentation, Chiara. Um, that was very much on time, which is great. Uh, and I think that also leaves room for just one question that came in during your presentation. I'll just read it aloud. It's from Nicholas Fry. He's asking, is there a cost effective place for low temperature resources below 75 centigrade in district cooling? And I assume that he's talking about 
waste heating to be used through absorbers for district cooling uh, with temperatures below 75 degrees. Is that something that, that you looked at in your technology reviews? Yeah, we are certainly considered a broad of a range of technologies, including absorption cycles at different uh, uh, working conditions. Um, that's certainly one point. But then in our, um, let's say, uh, results, we take into account technologies which are already ready for the markets. So we think that in this case, we will need more evidence and more uh, case studies, as I was saying before, on awareness. Um, to know more about it for having it cost effectively imp implemented, but we certainly see it as one of the potential solutions in the mix. Okay, thank you very much. And if there's any elaborations for that question, so please just type it in. I don't know if everyone has seen the, the QA function, but it's a very efficient way of asking questions. So if there are any, uh, please put them in there and then we'll try to pick them up either during the presentations or in the end. Okay, thanks a lot for your presentation, Chiara. Uh, now I will give a short uh, introduction to the market um, in Europe and what is driving it. Uh, let me just see if I can do that. Does everyone see my screen now? It's just a, a fairly boring picture with the uh, six old white men, but that's uh, where we are at DEFCO at the moment. We are a small business management consultancy uh, co company. We work with uh, district cooling over the last 20 years uh, to be a consultant and advisor and also co-developer and operator on a, a number of large district cooling schemes uh, in Europe and abroad. Uh, and I'll just give you a short introduction uh, to what we see in the European market. Um, as Chiara said, the demand for cooling is definitely growing and is growing uh, quickly. Um, so uh, what is then driving the district cooling? Let's see if I can make this work. Yeah, so basically, the market penetration in Europe is, is very, very low for district cooling. Two to three percent is what is, is estimated in the numbers that uh, Euroheat and Power have been collecting uh, in, the, in the district cooling group. Um, we see that the main customers are, of course, commercial buildings, large commercial buildings with a, a large demand for space cooling, but also public buildings and hospitals. Um, and then there are some industry clients uh, connected to some of the systems. Um, it's the market is very skewed, if you can say like that. Uh, there are a few mature countries with uh, 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 with, with a, a pretty big build out of district cooling, and then there are a lot of developing markets with uh, fewer systems. So just to look uh, at one of the mature markets, Sweden, uh, that actually has um, about 25 or 30 percent of the total installed capacity for district cooling in Europe. There is a, a capacity of, of more than uh, 900 megawatts um, and a total length of the network of more than 600 kilometers. And I think this is uh, mostly interesting because it, we don't really connect Sweden with being very warm. So it's not necessarily uh, that it's the outdoor temperature that at least only drives the development of district cooling. In Sweden, that's been a lot down to uh, switching out refrigerants uh, and having that uh, synergy uh, with the heating market that allowed uh, to develop a, a district cooling market based on heat pumps. If we look to France, that's sort of the other uh, developed market in Europe. Uh, there is installed capacity uh, of roughly uh, the same size. Um, of course, it's also a, a quite harder market and country to reside in. So therefore the demand for space cooling is sort of naturally bigger. Um, besides that in Europe, it's uh, there's a lot of city developments that are sort of dominating 
uh, the district cooling markets. Uh, Barcelona that we're going to hear from a little later. We have Berlin, Brescia, Milano. Uh, Copenhagen also has a, a fairly developed system. Uh, Lisbon, Munich, uh, Paris, um, and then Vienna. That's also going to present uh, a little bit later. And, and Stockholm, that's probably the most uh, mature and developed uh, district uh, cooling system in Europe. So just a little bit about the markets. Uh, and then why are we seeing these, this district cooling development and, and what is sort of driving it? Um, what we see right now is that it has a lot to do with the sector integration. And, and what is that? Well, sector integration is, of course, to utilize the benefits uh, when you couple heating, cooling and electricity. Uh, and as we see that the electricity demand is, is growing rapidly, so is the electricity production from renewable sources. And with district cooling, it allows you to, uh, to use uh, the electricity when it's produced cheaply, store it, and then uh, use it with the customer uh, at a, any given time. Uh, just an example from Denmark, uh, we expect that we have to invest one and a half billion euros in the capacity of the power networks over the next years to, to, to catch up with the development. But if we don't do this sector integration, then that investment will at least double. Uh, and we see that district cooling can offer a lot in the sector integration and sort of uh, do the peak shaving that Chiara also mentioned. Uh, and therefore, we're looking more at, uh, at flexibility of the system and also the efficiency for the entire system and not just for uh, the cooling system. Another point is the renovation cyclus. Uh, we see a lot of cities that is trying to, to drive down the, the carbon emissions in the city. Um, and we know that uh, the renovation uh, the renovation cyclus is 20 years plus, also for cooling systems. So by implementing district cooling, the city or utility can have a better feeling of uh, exchanging to uh, efficient uh, technologies and uh, uh, making sure that the cooling supply in the city is, um, is more renewable and more efficient. It also helps accelerate the deployment that Jaro was also talking about earlier. Uh, if we take it, as you say, one chiller at a time uh, in a city and leave it to the individual building owners, then it will take uh, a lot longer to be efficient and be uh, carbon neutral in that uh, segment. And we don't really have time for that. So what are the, the learnings uh, from some of the systems uh, that we see? And, uh, and of course, Vienna and Barcelona will also um, uh, give their input on that, but just a, a few uh, key takeaways that we have seen uh, is, of course, to have a, a, a master plan for district cooling development. Uh, but even more important than having the long term goal is probably to have uh, phases in it. So looking at what can be done within, let's say, two years and, and what does that first phase look like? and making sure that that can stand on its own feet uh, also uh, financially uh, and operationally so that that can be executed uh, and also you know making sure that we focus on uh, what is possibly locally uh, talking to the business owners uh, the building owners and getting them on board um, is, is really crucial um, so that's one point, another one is uh, to focus on what to build. No, honestly, it's, it's the other way around. We see that there's a lot of focus on technology, chillers, uh, absorption chillers, uh, heat pumps. Uh, but the key is really to build a, a business within district, uh, district cooling so that it gets economically viable and use the technical solution that allows for that. And then in time, you can always switch uh, your production technology. Uh, and most of the projects that we see that don't materialize is because they focus too much on what to build. Uh, so 
instead have more holistic view on uh, how to develop you know, from an organization perspective, from a commercial perspective, from a resource perspective, uh, from a financial perspective, make sure that the, a project uh, is, is fully developed. The last thing I'm just going to say is that there's a lot of talk about just leaving this to the market, uh, have the market develop district cooling. But if we look at just a typical, um, typical investor perspective, uh, there is a, a risk and a risk uh, expected return. And when that meets the profitability of a project, then, uh, then there's a chance that the market will pick up a project. Uh, so that's just a very typical way of, of looking at it. If we then couple that with uh, the different phases that we see in a, a district uh, energy, that could also be heating, but district energy development, um, we have the uncertainty uh, in the early phases of the development where we develop the business case and the feasibility are uh, extremely high. Uh, and therefore, it's very hard to have the market uh, uh, act on projects in the early stages. Um, another reason is that if we look at how the cost of developing a project is developing, uh, then the early stages are also fairly cheap uh, to develop. And then when you go into the more development of a project with uh, signing contracts and then the cost of development rises very sharply. And of course, in establishment, there's a lot of all the capex has to be put in there. So basically just taking away from this that we, we cannot expect the market to do all the early stage development on these projects because the profitability of these projects is just lower than the general uncertainty and therefore the risk associated with the early stages. Um, therefore, there has to be some kind of uh, collaboration between the, the public sector and the private sector to, to make these projects uh, appear. Well, I think that was enough from my side. Then we'll go straight to some of the, the good examples. Uh, and then we'll have time for, uh, for questions in the end. I'll stop sharing. And then I will leave the word to Alexander Varish from Vienna. Alex, the word is Hello. yours. Thank you. Hello, Hartley. Welcome from, from my side. Um, first of all, um, I would like to underline every word uh, Jacob Bjerregard uh, said. Um, I think this is also uh, the way we did uh, in Vienna um, we looked at it as a business and uh, we started um, some years ago um, uh, and just to, took the start, um, led to the way we, we had, uh, we are here having now. So I try to share my screen. Okay. Is it working? No. Oh. Um, so what what was our motivation to start with with district cooling? It was uh, we thought about it as a, a product that really fits very well to us. Uh, it it uh, it is a positive political awareness. Um, we it completes us as a as a energy uh, um, supplier, uh, it adds uh, a new product to what we can offer to our uh, customers. Um, and it has a, a great fit to us as a company uh, with our existing services and our existing infrastructure. We are uh, also uh, providing district heating. So um, district cooling um, is also uh, has, a, has, a, has a very great fit to us. So uh, this was our start, starting point, and then we saw also uh, we have uh, waste heat in the summer uh, we could use in absorption chillers. That was uh, also a, a kind of, of, of trigger, uh, which uh, 
led us uh, uh, to think about district district cooling. But I would guess it it is uh, uh, the second point. Uh, but um, it was an important point also, also for us. So we started with, with two main principles. We really uh, have a, a district cooling with a cooling plant and, uh, and a, a district cooling network, but also we implement a, a cooling on site uh, where, we, where we build up uh, with absorption chillers and, and, and compression chillers together. And we all uh, combine it as, as, as our district cooling uh, uh, concept because it is it, it leads to the to the same principle that we provide cooling to our uh, customers and we make it uh, individual for our customers and we try all all of the concepts with uh, to to maximize the efficiency so um, a short view about our development now uh, we have uh, about uh, 12 uh, dif different uh, sites now where we provide where we um, uh, produce cooling um, and it is a mix of uh, district cooling and uh, uh, decentral cooling with uh, uh, on site uh, district uh, uh, for example in in, in, uh, in a hospital like as in Tedos, we have a, a cooling site uh, cooling um, we provided on on site and for example, in the Spitalau, we have a plant with district cooling where we provide uh, the district cooling over networks. And uh, there is also a, sh a brief, uh, uh, some, some uh, figures about uh, how many uh, customers we already have. So the, the red line uh, shows you the capacity of the, of the uh, cooling uh, customers we we connected to our networks or uh, we provide with we will provide with cooling and so we you see we started in in 2006 and now we have about 180 190 uh, megawatts of, of uh, capacity in in the uh, um, on the at the customer side and uh, what is uh, well, our goal we set uh, ourselves in, in 2009 2010 was to have 200 in in 2020 uh, we nearly reached it so um, i think uh, we can say we we reached the goal um, that that we set uh, the, the vision we set ourselves so what do we need we need a, a production side uh, that is uh, where we where we can produce the the, uh, the cooling. We need a recooling. Uh, we do it uh, either um, over the the river, or we do it uh, either um, with uh, a cooling uh, with uh, open cooling towers. Um, this uh, it's the recooling is very important for the for the efficiency of the system. And uh, what we are looking now is uh, more and more is if we could use the, the heat from the recooling also for heating. There we see two, two concepts. Uh, one is, is uh, that, we, that we try to use it locally on, on low temperature level. Um, the, the, and uh, the other one is that we store it in, in geothermal uh, drill holes uh, and uh, use it then in the winter uh, for for heating with with uh, heat pumps. Um, it is uh, it is that is something uh, we are developing now. It, so the spread is not very uh, high, uh, but uh, we see it as a as a very interesting perspective for the using it uh, on locally level. Is is the problem is uh, always that that we have a heat in the in the summer where the use of the heat is is not so. Uh, not so good as it is in in the in the winter. So, with what we need for district cooling, yes, we need pipes. We need pipes to to provide the cooling to our to our customers. Um, and uh, sometimes it is it is tricky uh, because we are not the only one using the streets and uh, using the pavements. Uh, there is electricity, there is uh, gas, there is district heating, there is uh, uh, telecommunication. So there are a lot of, of infrastructures using the streets, but um, till now we always found, found a way uh, to connect our customers. 
And what we need is a, is a, a cooling exchanger at the customer side. This is uh, what uh, then provides the cooling to the customer. Um, and what the customer or we provide is, is the way how, uh, how the cooling is then coming into the, into the, the, the building, into the uh, flat or the, the, the uh, office. Um, so this is, uh, in, in most times, there are some kinds of fan coils or some kind of cooling registers or uh, ceiling coolings because most of the times uh, district cooling is for office buildings and and uh, not for for um, the uh, flats, uh, but we see that the, the development uh, of cooling in flats is growing uh, fast, very fast, fast. So we look more and more into uh, underfloor heating as also as use for for cooling. Um, to give you uh, a short picture of the inner city of, of Vienna, we started uh, there with one uh, a single project in 2012 in the middle uh, of, of the heart of, of the inner city, uh, which was no, uh, sorry, um, my computer is making some, oh, so, no, uh, where we provided a, a very small um, district cooling network and in 2013 we started with our uh, big uh, uh, district cooling site and uh, where there we connected uh, a lot of customers and, and the, the network is growing. Now um, this year we are building uh, our third cooling station in uh, on the other side of the of the um, of the inner city. I don't know if you see my my cursor. Uh, it's it's on the on the right side. Um, and uh, there we will develop uh, the, the district cooling network till to 2020 so that uh, our vision is uh, that that we can connect um, and so that we can provide uh, district cooling all over the, the inner city uh, because we have a connected network from from all the time so uh, what uh, we saw uh, yeah and, and not to forget uh, uh, that we that we uh, work together with with our city planning and we are with our city administration and uh, also not to forget that we also get for district cooling some some uh, subsidies um, that is uh, also a, a very important part and that takes place with uh, uh, the, the point that the district cooling has to be a business and uh, the the subsidies help us uh, that we um, can lower the, the investments, especially uh, taking it down to, to absorption chillers, uh, which are uh, investment heavy. And uh, so we can provide our customers uh, to a fair price. So what were the, the key points? We, we designed our vision uh, from the beginning and uh, we saw that uh, district cooling is and has to be a business. Um, the customer has to uh, say, yes, I'd like to connect to, to district cooling. So you have to provide uh, something um, uh, to a viable price and then the cost customer will connect. And uh, the, the, the figures show that, that, this is, uh, that this is true. And uh, to, to have this positive uh, also political awareness, um, you always have to uh, to do something special. So it, it, if it is an absorption chiller, if it is a very efficient uh, type of, of, of compression chillers um, that you that you're using, if you are using the waste heat for uh, for for uh, uh, heating or something, you have to you have to implement something uh, very high efficient. Uh, otherwise, uh, you will not gain the, the positive awareness. And um, this is what, what makes district cooling then uh, something special and, and something what the city is proud of. And uh, when, when the city is proud of, uh, you, get the, you, get the, uh, you get them to, to work with you together. And uh, 
what we also learned is that uh, there is not one concept. Uh, you always have to rethink and you always have to rebuild your system uh, uh, because there are uh, every customer is, is special and you have to rethink if, if for this type of customer or for this customer, uh, there is not a, a better solution than, uh, than you have already built somewhere else. So, um, for example, we are now uh, looking in uh, residential buildings, uh, very intense, and there we see that um, we, we will more combine it uh, with uh, deep, drill, uh, deep hole drillings uh, uh, to use uh, very locally uh, to provide uh, a low temperature um, heating and low temp and high temperature cooling. Uh, with uh, uh, floor and space heating, um, and that, that in this case, this is uh, the, the the better solution we see what what we will build up in, in Vienna to combine it with uh, district heating. Okay, thank you. That that were the, um, the points I wanted to show you. Thanks a lot, uh, Alexander, for your introduction to what is going on in in Vienna. It's very interesting and. And we'll quickly move on uh, to the next case, uh, Alexander Ivancic uh, from Aquasol, who's been involved in the district cool development in Barcelona for more than two decades. So, Alexander, the, the floor is yours. Thank you, Jakob. Uh, I'm very glad to share with you our experience. And good morning, first of all, good morning to everyone. Thanks to be here and to talk about this, uh, I would say, exciting topic. I, I believe district cooling is uh, one of the futures uh, absolutely necessary for energy transition. Uh, from, uh, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm working with Igosol. Igosol is a, a consultancy and engineering company which is involved in different technologies, different solutions, but especially in district energy. In this sense, we are uh, working with the uh, different United Nations uh, agency, UNDP, United, UN Environmental Program, several uh, development banks, and, and so on. Uh, in, in any case, our, our uh, track record includes from, I would say, applied research till the implementation, which is value chain. Alex, can you share your presentation? Oh, 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 sorry, 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 sorry. And just a second, uh, I forgot to share it. Uh, yeah. Uh, is it better now? Yeah, but maybe go into present. There you are. Yeah, excellent. Okay, Thanks. okay. Sorry for that. Um, well, talking a bit about Barcelona, I mean, Barcelona is a very well known place uh, for uh, urban uh, renovation, urban stra planning strategies. Even we have a kind of a model Barcelona in your Euro urban development, uh, let's say, um, uh, world. And yeah, it's, uh, I would say, very vibrant and very innovative city. And without uh, uh, willing to make too much other time for Barcelona, I, I believe it's really a fantastic place to live and to work. And in this sense, uh, I mean, Barcelona bet for <coughs> smart strategies and for smart city uh, trends. And uh, in, this, in this sense, urban services are very, very important to attract uh, I mean, innovative businesses, to, to attract uh, uh, new, new economy and all this kind of stuff. So in this sense, uh, I believe uh, district energy in general, especially district cooling, is one of, of the key uh, elements of these smart urban services. Well, for, for, for introduce uh, this kind of new infrastructure, which is, as you uh, for sure know, uh, very heavy in size, as well as in investment, um, you need to plan it. I mean, it's very, very important to, to make it in a, in a way, uh, in a coordination with all other players and stakeholders in the city. So in a way, planning is not uh, just beneficial, but it's absolutely a must. So it's totally necessary. 
Um, let me share with you uh, our track record in the city of Barcelona for the last 20 years. Uh, I mean, I'm not going to read everything. Uh, we are going to have this, this slide. But what I would like to underline is that uh, 20 years ago, uh, district heating was almost unknown in Spain and district cooling was, was totally unknown. I mean, it was completely new, uh, new uh, stuff there. So uh, in, in that sense, I, I would say that in 20 years uh, on the market where district energy was something completely puzzling, uh, we achieved to have four systems uh, in Barcelona uh, region and uh, some of them quite, quite nice and quite, uh, quite big. In this slide, you can also uh, appreciate that there was a lot of municip municipality or public initiative in order to promote uh, all these systems. But uh, what we see is that the private side also responded uh, very, very well. Actually, what we have now, it's uh, a, around a bit more of 150 megawatt uh, of cooling uh, contracted uh, by by all four systems. Uh, the biggest one is uh, Forum 22 at uh, District Lima. The second would be one which is uh, growing in port uh, and free zone, Eco Energias. And besides that, we have uh, one in Valles and one in Mataró, which are smaller systems. Also, uh, a new area which are rising uh, around the new railway station and mobility hub at Sagrera in planning and it's probably going to, to appear uh, in, some, in some years. Okay, so uh, what was the logic? And I'm talking about district heating and cooling probably for, for mature markets of, uh, of uh, heating, it's uh, not the case, but in our case, uh, heating and cooling uh, goes, uh, go hand in hand. So they're, they're always going together because uh, for our city, it's the way to promote district energy in general. So uh, in first place, I would say that uh, proactive local administration was totally the, the, the key element to the, the clue. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> so uh, the second point is that the project development uh, was done always from very deep uh, and detailed knowledge and understanding of local conditions, and local context, which is in some projects, in some places, not always the case. You need really to understand what's happening, uh, who is who, uh, who are the stakeholders, your, your, your environment, uh, and who can uh, jump on board, who can support the project, and who is going to be a competitor. In any case, uh, we always start from opportunity, means a source, an interesting renewable or waste energy uh, source, then uh, check the market, uh, see what, uh, what is the potential size and identify some anchors. Uh, as as in, in other district energy projects for cooling, the, the, the anchors are very important to be able to start the project. And from that point, we go for city planning at the same time with, uh, uh, with the preparation of, C of system concept. I mean, technology, uh, energy technology is at least as same as important as city planning. From that point, of course, we need uh, to make a business case and then to go for, for a procurement or for, uh, for tender to find a uh, private partner for, 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 for a project. In, in any case, uh, I would say that in all the projects which are operating now in Barcelona, uh, we have some common uh, threats. I mean, there is always public-private partnership. Uh, uh, private partner is always involved to the public tender. Uh, and then we have concessions of more or less 25 to 30 years. The share of cap capital is from private side 70 to 80% and the rest uh, 20 to 30 from the public uh, public side. Uh, so public uh, authorities are always involved in the project and stay in the project uh, after after the, the start. Uh, the maximum price is regulated, uh, usually indexed uh, to the fossils or and electricity for cooling, especially to electricity for, for uh, heating mainly to the fossil. And each system actually has an uh, independent uh, pricing system. 
we only has, has some anchor clients which helped us to start the project to, to, to make this this uh, dead valley uh, phase which is always very very difficult in in these so hard infrastructural projects and the uh, urban transformation uh, which is a kind of a trend in a lot of places we need to renew uh, renew our city especially in europe uh, so it's a, a kind of important driver because you always has, you have a very nice opportunity to introduce new infrastructure in, in these uh, uh, projects. And also in all the projects there was some public pre-finance, means the, the risking of the project, uh, some, some first investment, uh, uh, sometimes in, 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 um, in a sense of loans to the private uh, private uh, partner so if i uh, need to if i should uh, re stress really some 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 different some effects i would say that the uh, policy and strategic uh, planning was really very important and especially policy and strategic pl planning both in energy uh, terms and in urban planning terms and those two two plannings go going together is really something which uh, reinforce very much the uh, realization of this kind of projects. Then uh, I would say uh, leadership. Uh, I cannot imagine a successful uh, initiative without uh, uh, proactive local administration and uh, like a, a, a mayor or, or, or some uh, politician who is really uh, doing uh, and promoting this kind of, of uh, system and infrastructure, which is totally, totally okay, because uh, we are talking about uh, climate change, we are talking about uh, uh, energy transition, and this uh, infrastructure is very important in this sense. Okay, so, uh, and the, finally, I would, I would stress also public-private partnership, which is uh, uh, formed always around the project, in which is uh, not only shared investment, but also coordinated planning and implementation between uh, all the involved parties. And just uh, for uh, finalize my, my short uh, presentation, uh, if you, if you uh, want to get uh, local authorities on board for this important project, and I would say it's really important to have them on board, it's because it's, it's, it's a, a key trigger for me. Uh, I think you need to help the authorities, or uh, if possible, to, to, to the city mayor to answer the following questions. I mean, uh, why this is good for my city? This is uh, uh, something which all the politicians are going to ask, especially the mayor. Then, if it's good, how uh, how can I get it? How my city can get this infrastructure? What what are the, the environment? Uh, and then, uh, who are the stakeholders? Who who is playing in this in this uh, game? Who can help? Who can be a partner? And who is going to uh, be a competitor? And then, finally, uh, a mayor or a politicians uh, they want to, to know how can I, how can they push to have this in their city. Uh, after that, um, when you have political leadership, then it's very important to involve the city planners and then to identify and prove a robust business case, which is definitely very important. So as you see, I skip all the numbers, uh, just one figure, 150 megawatts uh, customers. Uh, because I think the, the technology, I mean, the technology is very important, but it's not the most important. It's not the single uh, issue which we, we need to treat. Because we, we see around the globe a lot of projects where we are talking only about technology. But uh, to, to, to make successful district uh, cooling project, you need to make it profitable, as my colleagues said. And you need to, to involve uh, all the city in order to uh, receive this uh, as Alexander mentioned, very hard and very uh, uh, big in size infrastructure. And uh, from that point, if you match all, all, all these uh, components, uh, then probably you're going to have a successful project. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Alex, for, for sharing the experiences from Barcelona.
Um, and now we have a few minutes left if there are any questions uh, from the audience. Uh, I see that we have one question coming in regarding sustainable materials for, for piping solutions. Um, and I know that uh, it, generally it's a mix of steel pipes and, and uh, HEPE pipes that are being used in uh, district cooling systems around. I know that the industry is doing a lot to reuse uh, the materials, both the steel, the foam, and the casing uh, in that. Uh, so that's an, an ongoing work in the industry to ensure that uh, the piping materials are sustainable and that they uh, can be reused. Uh, I don't know if any of the speakers have anything to add on sustainable materials for piping. Jacob, I, I would just add that uh, durability is very important. I mean, besides uh, sustainability, which is also uh, very important. I mean, if the same if the same piece uh, lasts for uh, hundred years, it's much better than if it lasts for for forty or fifty. And the uh, manufacturers are also uh, working very hard in and uh, in, in, uh, enlarging the life life uh, cycle of the of the piping. Yeah, very good point. Uh... Alex, um, if there's no questions, then I would like to ask a question for for Alexander one and two. Uh, what were the? How do you see the 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 pull coming from the building owners for district cooling? Is that a major factor, or is it more about uh, the utility of the city pushing district cooling? May I comment? Yeah. Okay, I, I mean uh, the customer is is actually the the, uh, the main the main point of all, all the this story. I mean, without customers, there's there's no uh, any kind of of uh, service, and definitely it's one of the more probably more complex issue to 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 assure the market and to to assure your clients. Uh, in in our experience in Spain, where as I said, this is not a very known system. It was quite hard, but uh, uh, it's it's the awareness is rising and people is uh, uh, catching the all the advantages of this system. Because at the end of the day, in in a tertiary uh, permis, you have a, like a shopping mall or or or, or office building or, or whatever. All the spaces, being it on the top roof, rooftop of the building or in the basement, where you usually have cooling equipment, you have more free space. And in the center of the city, free space is, is uh, I mean, uh, it value uh, the value is very, very high. So at the end of the day, the people is realizing that it's a very good solution, but it's not easy in the beginning. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Alex. I think we'll jump, jump to one of the questions that came in. Um, and maybe we'll turn that to Vienna. Uh, the question is about fixed charges as part of, part of the cooling charges. Uh, and how do you see the customer's perspective to fixed uh, charges? How do you see that in Vienna, Alexander Varish? Uh, I'm not sure if I understood the, the question. Okay, I think the question is uh, fixed charges compared to uh, commodity or energy charges only. I guess you have a mix of. Uh, ah, okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think uh, compared to 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 your own solution, uh, it's it's like like Alexander said, uh, it's it's always the customer who has to, des uh, to decide. Uh, uh, if he takes or if he takes not, and so he has to compare uh, his uh, what what he can do on his own and what he, can he do uh, with uh, district cooling. And so uh, his decision is also on um, taking one-time uh, high investments uh, or uh, to to connect the district cooling with uh, with uh, fixed charges um, with with a fixed capacity fee. So uh, he is uh, the, the customer is is. Uh, uh, looking on, on the perspective of if I uh, take a one-time investment uh, or if I uh, uh, take take fixed fixed uh, uh, charges for the capacity fee. So uh, that was uh, at the moment not really the problem in, in district cooling so far. Mm -hmm. um, and we, we are providing it with these fixed charges because uh, of, uh, of 
of the investments we we, we have to take and uh, in my opinion it is not fair for the customer then if we take uh, investments into the into the fee for for the working uh, load uh, because uh, that's not proper to to how the, the costs are built up so always when you have when you have this kind of, of transferring uh, investment prices into the into the working price then you all always have winners and losers uh, the ones uh, who uh, are not using uh, uh, very much working load uh, they, they are they would be the winners uh, even when they produce the same costs for the capacity because capacity is, is very very uh, uh, important and very, very uh, expensive. Mm. Okay, thank, thank you for your input, Alexander. And let's just jump to uh, another question. Uh, it's a question regarding the extent of renewables uh, contributing to district cooling. Uh, and uh, Chiara, I don't know, is that something uh, you have uh, input on from the IEA? Um, yeah, thanks for the question. Um, so of course we would like to have renewables contributing to district cooling as much as possible where, uh, where feasible and to exploit all the excess heat uh, and the free sources that, uh, that we have. Um, as is a very, very local program, problem, we uh, don't really have estimates for this right now, but uh, uh, how we see it is uh, as much as possible uh, um, uh, completely carbon-free uh, market, so on-site renewables or also the electricity that is used is coming from, from renewables. So the direction where we see it needs to go is to be a uh, very, very low carbon system. And uh, of course, the best mix uh, of solution, how to do that, it depends very much on the, on the location and the opportunities uh, uh, that we have in every area. Uh, and also, as I mentioned in the uh, publication, to exploit as much as possible the um, non-space cooling uses uh, while producing space cooling. So, for example, if there are uh, opportunities to provide heat, uh, or for example, in uh, very warm countries for hot water, or also for uses as uh, desalinations, we I think is something that can uh, really improve the case for uh, district cooling. Okay, thank you very much. And I know that we're running a little bit on over time here. I think we'll just continue for five more minutes if it's okay with everyone. Um, we have a question from uh, Mohamed Kata from Qatar Cool that asks about uh, what sort of uh, awareness campaigns uh, that you are running for your customers and what kind of platforms you use for that. And I think that question goes to uh, Barcelona or, or Vienna. Uh, would either of you like to talk a little bit about that? Well, um, awareness campaigns, campaigns are, um, I would say, say not uh, very extended uh, in, a, in like a, uh, wide communication because uh, our clients are not residential. I mean, it's uh, usually big uh, office buildings or hospitals, theaters, whatever, tertiary buildings. So you usually uh, work uh, client by, by client. And uh, especially in some areas of Barcelona, uh, there is a kind of uh, local rule which which says that you you should uh, use the most uh, efficient energy system uh, uh, you can design at your at your plot at your uh, site uh, so in that uh, that case the comparison of district energy with other other uh, solutions is uh, usually goes for for district energy so in a way the People is encouraged to they to make their own uh, small research and comparison and to arrive to the conclusion that this is something good, and this is this is very very working very good with the new plants with the new buildings which are arising, but when you have to switch uh, an existing building and to connect it to the to the district energy, 
uh, you find uh, usually the, the the situation that the, the client actually does not know what what is his cost of energy. I mean, not the cost of gas, electricity, or or, or let's say uh, um, the supply itself, but all, all overall cost of uh, cooling, for example, with uh, maintenance, uh, with shared just part of electricity which is going for cooling and not the rest of the building, a lot of uh, other services and so on. So you usually have a fight in let's say uh, or discussion about what not what's the cooling cost you are going to provide with your system, but what is uh, ben, uh, let's say base base case cost. Okay, thanks a lot, uh, Alex. Uh, let's jump to to Vienna. There is a specific question on what the the share and the form of subsidies or grants for for getting the district cooling system off the ground in Vienna. Uh, Alexander, can you share uh, a little bit about that? Um, in 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 Austria, we have a subsidy um, for uh, um, heating and cooling. Uh, um, and this this subsidy uh, takes about 25 uh, to to 30 percent of of the investments um also for for uh cooling uh with uh the, with uh, the point that uh, you have to use at least uh, 50 percent of of the cooling with absorption chillers so uh, it is it is bound to to use absorption chillers then then you are obliged to to um, get the subsidy for for the cooling and then it takes uh, about 25 to 30 percent of, of the of the investments okay thank you very much and i think we'll just uh, take one closing question and then round up and then i think people can stay in the chat if they want um but just to stay a little bit within the time limit uh chara there's a, a question on the rmp side on what is needed to advance district cooling even more uh, what are what are the opinions of the IEA on, on what is the most crucial R&D uh, piece for district cooling? Yeah, uh, thanks for the question. Um, I think one of the, of the key points is about this integration uh, part. So really developing some uh, uh, both technologies and control systems and um, demand responsiveness measures that uh, enable this uh, integration to to happen to really exploit all the benefits that uh, a technology as a district cooling can uh, um, i mean a set of technologies as district cooling can uh, can provide um, and on the second point uh, i think is uh, related to all the um, uh, technology related measures that can improve the design of the technology themselves. So thinking, for example, uh, of the refrigerant controls or new compressors to work with uh, um, low global warming potential refrigerants, I think is a priority as well as uh, um, the third point can be uh, related to integrating storage and uh, having uh, both it on uh, within the buildings and uh, within the network itself can be uh, something to, to look forward in the next years. Okay, thank you very much. And just uh, correcting myself a little bit, um, the Celsius Initiative saying that we can continue the discussion on the Celsius LinkedIn page um uh, because we need to close down i just want to say thank you to all the speakers for contributing to this very interesting talk um and then i will just give the word back to uh, emilia uh, if there's anything practical but otherwise i'll just say thank you for uh, being with us today Thank you, Jakob. Thank you to all the speakers. Uh, nothing in particular, just uh, kind of wonder if you enjoyed this Celsius talk. Next week, we'll have a similar one on funding, funding possibilities for cities, looking at the Innovation Fund, Horizon Europe, Smart Cities Mission, the Green Deal, and uh, the EIP Marketplace Matchmaking Program. So I've put the link on the chat. Uh, the recording for this webinar will be uploaded to our website along with the presentations. Thank you very much to everybody. Thanks, bye.